Hello Chem 1, at this point in time you know how to name ionically bonded substances and covalently bonded substances. The last step is learning how to name different types of acids. Let's get started. There are two different types of acids that you need to know how to name, binary acids and oxy acids, and their name kind of tells you what they might be. A binary acid is an acid that has two things, and one of those things will be an H plus cation. Acids, oxy acids and binary, will always, always, always have hydrogen, H+, as the cation. And so with a binary acid, it's going to be the H plus ion with some other cation, which is going to be a nonmetal. The way we name these binary acids is we put the prefix hydro before the name of the anion, then we name the anion, and we change the IDE ending to ic. So this becomes pretty simple. You know that in lab we've used hydrochloric acid quite a bit. What does that look like? It's an H plus ion with a chlorine anion, hydrochloric. You can see here we have an H plus ion with a fluorine anion. So this would be hydrofluoric acid. Here's an H2TE. So what would this be? It would be hydrotelluric acid. And you might be thinking to yourself, well, why is it H2 that time and the other time it was just one H? Well, chlorine is a minus one, fluorine is a minus one. But if you look at tellurium, it is in the oxygen family and it has a negative two charge. So you still need to balance this out like it's an ionic compound and that's why we need the two hydrogens to balance out the charge of tellurium. But the naming is the same, hydro prefix, anion with ic at the end, and then acid. So the binary acids are pretty simple to name. The oxy acids get a little more complicated because we have so many different types of polyatomics that have oxygen in them. An oxy acid will be a hydrogen cation, okay, it's still an acid, with a polyatomic anion that has oxygen in it. You know from naming ionic compounds that we have lots of different polyatomics with oxygen that can end in eight, like nitrate, but they can also end in ite, like nitrite. We can have pernitrate, and we can also have hyponitrite. So let's talk about these variations and how we name them. First of all, oxy acids never, never, never have the prefix hydro. That's a binary acid. Sometimes kids get confused about that. The rule is pretty much this. If the anion ends in eight, we're gonna drop the eight and make it ic. Remember that per has one more atom of oxygen than the eight anion. We'll review this on the next slide. So we've got chlorate, which is ClO3 minus one. Perchlorate would be ClO4 with a minus one charge. An it anion, we're gonna drop the it and we're gonna put us. Remember that hypo is one less oxygen than the it anion. So chlorite would be ClO2 minus, and hypochlorite would be ClO with a minus one charge. We've talked about this before, but here are some of the major polyatomic anions that have oxygen present. So nitrate would be here at NO3 with a minus one charge. And at this point, we can go up and down the series because we know that ite is gonna have one less oxygen, same charge, and hyponitrite would have one less oxygen with a negative one charge. And then per nitrate would have one more oxygen. Here we have sulfate. I would look up sulfate on my polyatomic anion list. I would see that sulfate is SO4 with a minus two charge. That means sulfite is SO3. Hyposulfite is SO2, one less oxygen. And then per sulfate would be SO5 with a negative two charge. Remember that within a series, the charge stays the same. You can fill out the rest of this chart, but the basic idea is to look up the anion you know from your list, and then you can go up and down the series, adding oxygen or taking them away. So let's do some examples. The first thing you would do with an oxy acid, and we know these are both oxy acids because they have oxygen in the anion, is to identify the anion. So we have SO3. We know that sulfate is SO4, I believe sulfite is also on your polyatomic anion list. So we have sulfite. Our naming rules say that if we have something that ends in ite, we change the ending to us. 
So this would become sulfurous acid. In the case of sulfur and phosphorus, a lot of times we put the UR or the OR back and then put the OUS on. You'll get more comfortable with this as we do more examples. Here's the next one down below. We have SO5. Well, if I know that sulfate is SO4, so this is 8, so that means SO5 must be per sulfate. And if that's per sulfate, I know that when we have an 8 ending, we change the ending to ic. So this would become per sulfuric acid. Notice we don't have a hydro prefix here. It's just whatever that anion is named, changing the ending to either ic or us, depending on if it's eight or it. So if you're given the names and you need to write the formulas, the covalent ones are the only ones that we don't need to crisscross. If you have a name of a covalent compound, you're gonna have the prefixes there that's gonna tell you how many of each element you need. With acids, when you're given a name, you're gonna identify the polyatomic and you're gonna crisscross an H plus plus one ion with whatever charge the anion is. So, we have phosphoric acid. Since this is ending in ic, we know that the anion has to be an eight. So this would have been phosphate. Now we can look up phosphate on our polyatomic and see that it's PO4 with a minus three. And so now we can take our H plus cation and we can crisscross, meaning that this is gonna be H3PO4. We need three hydrogens to balance out the negative three charge of the phosphate. The next one down here, we have hypophosphorus. So since this is us, I know that it had to be it, which means that this would have been hypophosphite. I know phosphate is PO4, which means phosphite is PO3, one step down, and hypophosphite would have been PO2 with a negative three charge. So that means we would still need three hydrogens to balance it out, but the formula would be H3PO2. So the expectation is that you can take any ionic, covalent, or acid and go from formula to name or from name to formula. Once again, this chart does a really good job of taking the procedures and breaking them down into very simple steps. I would recommend using the chart when you get lost and then trying to slowly remove the chart and do them without using it. This is gonna require a little bit of practice. Keep working on the examples. Let me know if you have questions. We will see you soon.